look, look at this. <laughs> Hello, Nigeria. Hello, Africa. You're welcome to Sports Business with Oru4 Ezaga. You're watching Plus TV Africa, and we're reaching you live from our studios in Victoria Island, Lagos. Now, that was Katsina United fans you know, show, displaying the newfound interest in the Nigerian Premier Football League. It is also a good mood for us as today we celebrate the 64th Independence Day anniversary in Nigeria. Things are changing. Things are tough, actually. But um, by the day, we are, we're seeing that things are beginning to change. And, uh, you know, it's our Independence Day. Nigeria is growing. And um, I would like to use this forum to call on everybody to contribute a little bit to making sure that Nigeria becomes the successful nation that we all desire to see. Today, we're going to be talking about football. And I believe that football and the Nigerian Premier Football League is one of the ways we can begin to change our country. Because the impact of football in any country is huge. And in Nigeria, we have, we have not witnessed this for, uh, in, for the last three decades or so. And I think that we have reached a turning point and things are beginning to change. And when the Football League in this country hits its stride, I have no doubt that it would you know, impact on the economy seriously, creating lots of jobs and you know, attracting a lot of wealth into the country. All right, today, so we're going to be talking about the MPFL. Uh, and we're going to be talking about football generally across the continent. Today, we have an excellent you know, guest who's going to be talking to us about football in South Africa. He's part of the people that developed the South African Premier Soccer League into the success that it is today. It is actually the most financially successful league in Africa. And we hear that it is one of the top 10 leagues now in the world. The MPFL has potential. It has great potential. You know, and it's a huge opportunity for us here in Nigeria. How do we make it a success? Joining us to talk about this will be Dr. Robin Peterson. Um, he is a former C CEO of the, the Premier Soccer League in South Africa, that's the PSL. And he was also the, the CEO of the South African Football Association, with the P the, which is called, for short, SAFA. Now, Dr. Robin Peterson is a former, um, sorry, he's a co founder of the of SPN Africa. He, he's the CEO, actually, of SPN Africa. And they are a pan-African news, um, sports news and streaming portal. And he's also the co-initiator of the Global Safe Hub Campaign, an award-winning social enterprise that uses football as a key part of a transversal youth development intervention. Safe Hub started in Cape Town in 2008. And today, it's across South Africa, as well as in Germany and the United States. And they're currently developing a new site um, somewhere in Côte d'Ivoire. He's an author, a public speaker, and a former ad academic who has a PhD from the University of Chicago. That's who we have today. So I'd encourage you now to you know, stretch your legs and, and take you know, a breather, because over the next 45 minutes, Dr. Peterson is going to be talking to us, he's going to be sharing with us his vast knowledge on you know, a football business in South Africa as well as on the continent. We're going to go on a short break for just about a minute or less. And when we return, we'll have Dr. Peterson ready to share his knowledge. You're welcome back to Sports Business with Uru Foyzag, and you're watching Plus TV Africa, um, and we're reaching you live from our studios in Victoria Island, Lagos. Joining us from South Africa is um, Dr. Robin Peterson, a former CEO of the, the, the PSL, as well as SAFA, and um, he's going to be sharing his experience running football in South Africa and developing the PSL into becoming the top league in Africa in terms of revenues. All right. Hello, Robin. How are you, Urufu? It's very nice to be with you and uh, with all the rest of those who are joining us today. Okay. So, how do we begin? Let's talk about the PSL first. You know, um, 
lots of good things are happening in the PSL, you know, and um, it's stuff that would like to, bar to you know, uh, would, stuff that would like to happen to our league in Nigeria, but it's not happening at the moment. You know, how did you guys build the PSL into such a top property? You know, starting from when it began in, in 1996, I think. If I remember correctly, or if my research is right, you became the second CEO of the PSL. So you're very converse, conversant with what happened in the early days. What, how did you envision the PSL and, you know, how far have you come based on what you envisioned all those years ago? So thank you. Yeah, I was very fortunate um, to have been uh, CEO of, of, of the Premier Soccer League. Mm. Um, I, I was actually the third CEO, the second one uh, with John Glenn, and he was there for a few years. Okay. Um, I, 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 um, uh, I, came to, I came to the PSL having been an academic, uh, so not having been in, in, in football administration, but I had been doing some consulting work for SAFA for a few years and then had become the general manager for the 2006 World Cup bid company. You remember we, we, we bid for the World Cup in 2006 up against Germany and England and Brazil uh, and Morocco and uh, Germany of course won it with a very controversial um, result of vote in, in, in 2000, in the year 2000. And, uh, at, actually while we were in Zurich um, commiserating at the end of the, the announcement of the vote, I got approached by one of the, the, the club owners back then. He was then the owner of uh, Mamelodi Sundowns, one of the Krupp brothers. That was before Dr. Mutepe took over as the owner. And, and asked um, whether I would, and, and told me that the PSL was, I knew they were looking for a, for a CEO, and he encouraged me to apply, which I did, and, and I I got I got the position. Uh, the, the PSL at that time was in a very um, different state to what it is now. Mm. Um, uh, so so maybe that getting that perspective also gives one in, in other countries like Nigeria some hope. Okay. In those days, um, the, the the PSL was was fairly new. It had established itself. Um, it was it was uh, well functioning, and, and but its funding was was relatively poor. Um, I remember, if my memory serves me correctly, in those days we were able to give each club uh, a monthly grant. If I remember correctly, it was about a hundred thousand rand, maybe less. Um, um, from which they then had to pay for their, their run their team, uh, uh, pay, pay their travel costs, etc. And um, uh, these days, you know, that figure is, 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 is 10, 15, 20 times that amount. So the, 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 the key challenge that, that we identified back then, uh, there were two. The, the one was we were not getting great uh, crowds, except for the derby, which is of course the derby between Kaiser Chiefs and Orlando Pirates. Mm. That was the only match that we had a, a, a full stadium. Mm. Um, the, the crowds were, were not there in, in the way they are now. And our television contract at that stage was with the South African Broadcasting Corporation, SABC, which was a state broadcaster. And Supersport were, were knocking on, on my door back then and saying, listen, we need to get football, South African football, onto, onto Supersport. And I must say that if I look back, on, I was only a PSL CEO for two years. Um, when I look back on what I probably think was my greatest achievement there, it was doing the first Supersport television contract. Okay. Um, we, we, were able, we were able to carve out a separate contract with with the um, uh, with, with Supersport for a midweek series of games. So what we did was we we committed to I can't remember the number, maybe twenty games that would happen on a Wednesday night or a Tuesday night. Um, it, it caused some challenges for some clubs because we had to up the the, the flood lighting and the lighting conditions on the grounds. And there was a lot of skepticism on, on Supersport board side that this would would actually lead to something. Um, little did they know, I think, except for the very visionary um, 
he was at that stage a board member of, of, of the PSL, um, MTS Patel. Um, uh, but MTS realized, I think, back then that, that South African football would actually drive um, super sports growth in a massive way. And so we were able to carve out and, and, and run for the first year that, uh, that super sports television um, uh, package. And, and, and as we all know, I think the story goes that, that uh, maybe three years later, um, Supersport took over the main contract um, for, uh, from SABC. And, and from there on, I think the league has grown from strength to strength. Because the money that they received from World Bank last right was then reinvested into the clubs. Mm. That's the most critical point. Where does it, it's, it's all good and well to get a big you know, amount of money coming in, but that money then got reinvested into the clubs on an equal basis. So every yeah. club got the same grant every month. And from that, it meant that you were able then to see the smaller clubs starting to have the resources to hire players, uh, to keep good coaching staff, to improve their marketing, and then the stadium started to fill up because the product that people were seeing on television was a good product. Mm. And that kind of was a, a virtuous circle. If you have a poor product on TV, mm. people will stay away. If you have a good product on TV, people will think, wow, I'm missing out. I need to be there. I need to go there. And, um, and and they started, and, and, and I think that was the beginning of, of the of the, the massive growth uh, of, of of the PSL. There were some other things as well, which we can get into. And I think uh, probably if I were to name them, it would be your television rights. It would be governance. I think mean, governance, both at a league level and at a club level, are critical critical elements uh, for success. Um, club licensing, marketing, and then player contracts and player conditions. I think those would be the, the things that, that um, uh, I would say have been at the core of the PSL success. Okay. Um, you, when you, you, you talked first about um, um, the struggles of the P PSL at the start, Right. Um, if you if you could expand on that a bit, you know, what sort of struggles do you, did you have? I'll give you an example. Like in Nigeria, for instance, we have a problem with, you know, fans coming to the stadium. You know, and maybe that's a, a function of the sort of product that they're getting. But here, as with much of sub-Saharan Africa, you find that the success of the European leagues, the more glamorous U European leagues, have. <laughs> Have generally affected um, have generally affected our leagues and the popularity of our leagues. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, you talked about corporate governance. Um, that's still a problem here, even though efforts are being made to clean up things. All right. So yes, there's this pro we have these problems. But I noticed that with the PSL, you still had some sort of financial support from the start. If my research is right. From the, from the time you started until now, there's been some sort of sponsorship, at least for the name sponsorship um, for the league, which would have injected some money. You said you were paying clubs about 100,000 um, rand, which was a pittance compared to today. But clubs in Nigeria today don't even get 100,000 rands a month to run. You know? So exactly where are we supposed to get this sort of support that we need to then up you know, our game in, in, in the MPFL. So again, it, 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 it's, it's kind of a, 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 either a virtuous or a vicious circle mm. that happens. So let's start with a virtuous circle. Okay. So the virtuous circle begins with a product that um, uh, sponsors are interested in attaching their brand to. Mm. That's where it begins. Now, why do sponsors attach their brand to a product? Mm. They attach it because they're wanting to achieve a certain marketing reach mm. in a way that reaches a certain number of people and, and does so in a way that does brings uh, excitement and passion to their own brand. So, so from the beginning, 
uh, 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 PSL had always had um, a corporate sponsor. In those days, it was SM Breweries, who were the league sponsor at the time. We also had a sponsor in MTN who was sponsoring at that stage the, 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 the first division. So the, 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 the professional football, the national football league structure in South Africa runs both the, 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 the Premier League, the, the PSL, the Premier Soccer League, and the first division. When I was CEO, the first division was divided into two streams. It wasn't a national product. It had two streams. It had the um, uh, uh, a coastal and a inland stream. And one of the things that I started the process and we really were trying to do was to create a national first division, which has subsequently come into being. So, so we had, first of all, uh, a sponsor like SM Breweries, really good sponsor for, for football. Um, and we had other, you know, it was at the beginning of the mobile, um, uh, 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 mobile telephony um, uh, uh, startups in a way they've been going for five years or so, mobile telephones. And so we had Vodacom and MTN, two South African um, mobile phone companies, also putting money both into clubs and also into tournaments. Mm. So there were a number of tournaments that we had. So we had the league. We also had a top eight tournament that we had sponsored. Mm -hmm. We had a cup. And for a, a, a strange reason that has to do with our apartheid years, mm -hmm. the league itself actually owned what's effectively the FA Cup. Mm -hmm. um, the, the FA, the Football Association, doesn't own the cup, which is a bit of an anomaly from the rest of the world. And, and when I was South and CEO, it was a, it's a problem that the league doesn't, that, that the FA doesn't own the cup. But nevertheless, the league owned the cup. It owned. It, we had a league cup. We had a, a top eight tournament, and we had the, the, and all of those were sponsored. And from that sponsorship, we had prize money and we had participation money. So we were able to, to, to provide money to the clubs, not just to the ones that were winning, but also some participation money all the way down through the ranks. So, so it was important that, that you, you had a product that sponsors wanted to attach their brand to. Now, they are only going to get the returns that they want if they're putting in big money, if they, if they are able to, to get their uh, sponsorship branding onto television, because television is the way that you achieve an audience. Well, at least in my days, then it was the only way. Now, of course, you have social media and a whole range of other ways that you can reach an audience that didn't exist back then. But television audiences were and still remain a really important part of, of, um, uh, of any sponsorship of any football business. And uh, we know, in fact, in, 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 in the English Premier League, you know, it's the television rights that drive, um, that drive the success of that league. It's the television rights that certainly has driven the success of the Premier Soccer League in South Africa as well. But so you've got to have a television product that sponsors want to take part, and then you have to make sure that you maximize the delivery of that sponsorship return. So what does that mean? It means you have to have your perimeter boards up, and they have to be consistent. For every televised match, there has to be a consistent offering of television uh, uh, of perimeter boards. So that was another important thing that the league did from the beginning, and still does, it centralized the control of the perimeter boards for all televised matches. So for televised matches, the league actually, we, we employed, uh, appointed a, a, a partner, a worldwide sports, who then delivered for us and made sure that there was a perimeter board, uh, 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 that perimeter boards in those days, they weren't electronic, they've become electronic in many instances. But even if they're not ele uh, electronic, we made sure that there was a consistent set of perimeter boards at every televised match. Mm. Now, what does that mean? It means that you can guarantee your sponsors a return. Mm. Now, I don't know 
what what the situation is because we don't aren't able to and I haven't watched much um, uh, of, of Nigerian league football. I have seen perimeter boards, but I don't know if those are done in a consistent way for every televised game. If they're not, you're leaking money because you cannot then track and give a return to a sponsor that says for every million rand or every whatever you put in, you're going to get a five-time return. How do they measure that return? They measure that return through brand exposure. Whether it's exposure on the sleeves, on the, on the chest, of course, the clubs keep the rights to the chest, but the league has its own place on the sleeves. But the league and its sponsors, they must own the perimeter board space. And, of course, the clubs must be able to have their own sponsors having their space within that. So we, we would have a a plan for the perimeter boards that were put up by an outside partner, partner that was accountable to the league so that the league was able to ensure that the brand returns could be there. Similarly, with, with, with the, 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 the step and repeat boards uh, for your interviews, your post-match interviews, etc., etc., those have to be controlled and done in such a way that you do not leak revenue. Because for every sponsor every time that it's not there you're losing money that you could be earning as a league that you could then redistribute to the clubs uh, okay um, let's look at let's look at your time at safa and how you affected the psl um what was the focus when you were you were at safa we're going to come back to your PSL tenor. I just want to put this in at, at this point in time. What was the focus when you were at SAFA? Was it in growing Bafana Bafana or it was in growing the PSL? Where did you see the money at that time? So the, the, the relationship between SAFA and the PSL, like it is between the, the, uh, the, the FA and the English Premier League, is that the PSL is a separate uh, entity Okay. It, is a, it has its own governance, mm. it's its own finances, it raises its own money, it runs independently to a degree, 90% independently of the Football Association. And um, it, it actually uh, uh, pays some money to the Football Association, not enough in my, in my mind, it should be paying more. Uh, the Football Association controls the referees, uh, it controls the club licensing, which which is an important uh, control mechanism for it. And of course, the league has members that sit as a special member on the, the, the board of the Football Association. The chairman of the league is always the vice president of the Football Association, or one of the vice presidents of the Football Association. The league itself um has i think four members or five members on the on the board of governors on, on the national executive committee of, of the football association so the football association has a different mandate its mandate obviously is all of football but it has to focus on the national teams and nine national teams that that we have in our country if you come futsal and the, and the youth teams it has to focus on development it has to focus on officiating. It has to focus on regulation and governance. It has to focus on um, putting in place all the structures of talent identification and development from the lowest levels. So, SAFA has got 300, uh, South African Football Association has got 343 local football associations, which is where clubs play, um, register, and participate in local leagues, local structures. Then there's 52 regional structures, and then the national body. Um, so it's a very, very big organization to govern. It's got a very different mandate, and it is judged by the success of the national team, primarily Bafana Bafana, although, of course, Banyana Banyana are, are, are really a growing important part of, of that. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, so I was going to ask, you, and, and that's the point that you, you the, the last point that you made. The reason I asked ab about whether you know the PSL was the priority or whether Bafana Bafana was the priority was because I wanted to know how the influence of Bafana Bafana uh, on the um, 
what sort of influence he had on the success of the PSL. Did it make a difference that um, uh, the, the, uh, the majority of the players in, in Bafana Bafana were from the PSL? Did that drive the, pop the popularity of the PSL, for instance? So this is an interesting thing. Um, and it's a question that I wrestle with when I think about South African football. Um, when I was when I was a, a, a PSL CEO, okay. there were a number of challenges. Um, firstly, there was not a coordinated FIFA calendar, and what that meant was that mm, international matches, particularly friendlies, SAFA could call those pretty much at any time. There weren't dates, there weren't international windows as there are now, mm. and and the rule was that if you had a if you were a club and you had more than three players called up into a national team, whether it was Bafana or the under-23s or the under-20s, if you had more than three players called up into the national team, you had the right to request for a postponement of your league fixture. Mm. And that led to a massive, massive challenge. Not only that, as we all know, the challenges with, with, with CAF participation um, from a club uh, perspective, when I would see uh, Mamelodi Sundowns for the first time got to the finals of the CAF Champions League, and we had to postpone the, you know, the, the, the league fixtures that they were participating in, and of course they went right to the end. So we had more and more fixtures that were piling up, and that led to what I think was the biggest um, the thing that I live with the most, and my, the worst part of my time at, 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 at SAFA, but it's a pertinent thing for to remember, uh, is that I was CEO at the time of the Ellis Park Stadium disaster, when 43 people tragically died mm. in the football match between Orlando Pirates and Kaiser Chiefs mm. in April uh, of 2001. Mm. And, and the reason that that match and that, that tragedy happened, the background to that region, reason was that we had all of these fixture postponements and we couldn't fixture the derby on a weekend because we had no weekends left in the season. So we had to make it a midweek fixture and, um, and of course a nighttime fixture and that just led to a series of catastrophes that ended up in that, that terrible tragedy. So the point I'm making is that um, uh, there's a big difference now. The other thing that was very different back then was Bafana Bafana, if you take our winning squad in 1996 and the one that went to the first World Cup in 1998, and in 2000 we played in Ghana, we got to the finals, I think, yes, we got to the finals. Most of our players, 80% of our players were playing abroad. They weren't playing in the, in, 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 in the PSL. The reason for that was that players were not paid well in the PSL back in those days because there wasn't enough money in the ecosystem of the league to pay players good salaries. One of the challenges we have now, from a SAFA perspective, not a league perspective, from a SAFA perspective, is that in fact, ironically, and this is just my own opinion, ironically, the very success of our league has, I think, had a negative impact on, on a Bafana Bafana. Because unlike, whenever we play matches across the continent in qualifying, we play, we play um, Cape Verde Islands, you know, we've got whatever, 500,000 total population or less. But when you look at their players, where they're playing, they're all playing in Portugal, mm. or in Spain, or Italy. They're playing in these top, competitive global leagues and you look at Bafana Bafana and 95% of the players are playing in the PSL. Now for the PSL that's fantastic because you're getting, you know, you, you, there, there's a wonderful um, uh, thing to say that we've got our Bafana players playing in the local league and the reason they can do that is that the league is so successful that they can pay these players really good salaries. In fact they, they, they compete with the sort of second tier salaries that players are earning if they're playing in Europe. So, but for the downside for the national team, I believe, and it's my opinion, is that there's not enough of a burning economic incentive mm. for our very good players to go and make a career in the international leagues. And, 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 and what's that downside? That downside is 
that they're not playing week in and week out against the world's best players. And, you know, unlike the, if you take your Nigerian national team, you know, your players, I don't know, probably at least 80% of your players, if not more, are playing in the top leagues around the world, whether it's uh, the Premier League or La Liga or Serie A, whichever it might be. Um, so so there's a, there's a, there's a ironic um, downside from a SAFA perspective, but it's a very big upside from the league's perspective. And that's part of, you know, I think our, our, our ongoing challenges and developments that we have to face in this country. I'd like to have your problem, actually, uh, if, if you, if you, <laughs> no, it's in, in truth, I, I, I think if we, the, I think the opposite is the case in Nigeria, right? Mm -hmm. Where our best players don't even play in the league at all. You know, before they have an opportunity to, to play in our league, they've already been, you know, shipped overseas to go and play, you know? And so what you then have is a situation where, you know, the league is then left with the rest, the best of the rest. And, and I think that, you know, when you look at it from the commercial perspective, you know, the, a lot of people playing in the PSL, earning a lot of money in South Africa is good for, for your economy as well. So I guess that in, in every situation, you have to have, we have to look at the pros and cons, I, I suppose. But Absolutely. given the, yeah. the, 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 the state of Nigerian football right now, I think I, I'd, rather, <laughs> I'd rather have your problem. Robin, we're going to go on a very short break. And when we return, this time we're going to focus more on the, on the MPFL. You're welcome back to Sports Business with Orufo Izaga. You're watching Plus TV Africa, and we're reaching you live from our studios in Lagos. We've been having a very engrossing time with Dr. Robin Peterson, uh, a former CEO of the South African Football Association, as, as well as um, the South African Premier Soccer League, the PSL. Um, uh, doc, OK, so welcome back. Um, we're going to see, uh, we're going to look at a few um, um, moments in the MPFL where you know we see some really uh, good quality football, and uh, we're, we're still trying to get the fans to to hop on the train and uh, you know to, to to generate the sort of support that the league needs for us to be, to attract the the uh, corporate sponsors and the like. Um, so if we look at that, we'll come back and then we'll talk a bit more about um, what we need to do in the MPFL. Here's Uche, the passing behind the defense. I have it! It's brilliant! What a fantastic goal! Minutes on the clock, very much starts now. Fakma winner, chesting the ball beautifully. Finding Alex Oyowa to his left inside. Back now to Fakma winner, Tibbulis. Alex Oyowa, Oyowa again! <laughs> Remo Snaz take the lead inside five minutes of the second 45. And what more than they deserve of all of their brilliant football. The Sky Blue Stars have indeed conjure up a way to break down this resilient defensive half of Rangers International. Remo Snaz to take the lead. It's a brilliant give and go from the Sky Blue Stars. Alex Oyowa would celebrate with what would be his very first ever goal in the Sky Blue Stars color. Just one beyond Lucky Abdullahi. The league is begin, beginning to be a bit more interesting. Uh, and to be fair, fans, the interest of fans is beginning to, you know, to rise. Uh, we now have the television on, uh, we now have this, the league matches, most of the league matches on t television. And we have um, a streaming uh, platform that also streams the most matches. All right, so the, the opportunity is there, but we still don't have, the, the deal for the MPFL is, is, is still, a long shot from from what probably your first ever television deal was in South Africa. It's still very far, you know. And just now, I did just before I came to the studio, I did something of a table of what you guys earn in South Africa, what the players earn in South Africa, and what the players earn in Nigeria. It is it, it is as if we, are, we we belong to different worlds entirely. And this is the African continent. Yeah, that's the slide there. 
You know, I don't know how far this is true, but I got this from um, the, Go the Gauteng um, website, where the top earner in South Africa is earning 166 million naira a month. And the top earner in Nigeria is earning just 1.3 million naira a month. So there, that's where, th so you see why I say to you, Robin, that I would rather have your problem where, you know, the players, the best players choose to play na now in Nigeria rather than just jump overseas at, this, at the slightest opportunity. So what do you think of, 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 of um, what do you think we have to do now, Robin? How do you think we can attract the money into our leagues? So, so let me go back and just comment on what you've said. And, and so I, I think the challenge is that your top, if your players are playing in the top three or four leagues in the world, mm. that's great for your national team. Yeah. Your challenge, I see it, and I remember doing the study with my, with my partner in SPN Africa, Emeka in Yadike, Okay. and we were looking at the number of Nigerian players playing in leagues across the world, you know, from mm. Afghanistan to, to Hungary to wherever, mm. to South Africa, and there, there were hundreds. So you're not just losing your, your, your top tier, you're losing your second, third, and fourth tier. Absolutely. Of, of, of players. So, so that's, a, that's a really big, big challenge. And, um, you, you know, I, 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 as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, mm. the, the NPFL is, is, is not structured like the PSL in the sense that the clubs don't run the league. Yeah. It's run by the NPA. I, 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 I could be wrong, but that's, that's the information that I think I have. And, and, and I'll go back so, to... Sorry, to uh, Robin, one second. The NPFL is run by um, an NPFL board. It's not, yes. yeah, and it is um, it's run by an MPFL board, and then they have a, a strategic partner uh, that's an investment banking firm in Nigeria, yeah? And then there's the, the, the NFF, which, which it's a bit of a, you know, um, uh, of a complex structure. There's the, NP, mm -hmm. the NFF, which is the football, the football federation. There's the, the, the league body that uh, oversees the league that I, is appointed by the, by the NFF. And then there's the strategic partner that is the investment banking firm. You know, so that's, um, that's what it is like at, at, at the moment. So obviously in, in, in South Africa, as I mentioned before, the PSL, um, like they did in England when the Premier League broke away effectively from the control of the Football Association and set themselves up, South Africa works slightly differently because during apartheid, during our, our terrible years of apartheid, mm. we were banned from FIFA. Mm. So there was effectively no uh, football association. There was a very small amateur body. So the league was the big dog in town because it, it just ran everything. Mm. So when SAFA was formed, uh, the league still kept its own uh, independence. It didn't need to sort of break away uh, as as the as the, uh, the the English Premier League did when they had their in a sense a palace coup against the Football Association and set themselves up um, independently. Now I think there are pros and cons to both. So I'm not. Um, but here's the thing: the 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 the, the PSL is owned and run by the clubs. Hmm. So if you are a club in the um, Premier Soccer League and there are representatives clubs from the first division. You have a seat on the Board of Governors. There's also obviously an executive committee. That's a big difference from when I was there and, and what they have now. And I think it was a, a very, very wise governance decision that they took. When I was there, they had an independent chairperson and the CEO. And then the rest of the governance structure was the Board of Governors. And that meant every club, so there were in those days 18 clubs, uh, every, every club had its member on the Board of Governors, and there were two representatives from the, 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 the first division. And they governed, they, 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 they employed the CEO, they ran the league. So when decisions were made about how does the sponsorship money get spent, 
it was there. They all had access to that, and they made the decisions about how that money would be spent. Mm. It wasn't um, uh, controlled by another body who would then, it was determined by the clubs themselves. So effectively, they were, it made for a difficult governance as a CEO because clubs are wanting one to look after their own interests, um, but they also recognized that without a strong league, their own interests would be minimized. Mm. So, so that was an important thing that the clubs effectively have a very strong say or, or, or run the, the, the governance structure of the league. Mm. The big change that happened after I left, we started the process, we had some workshops when I was CEO, but it kicked in a few years later, was they set up an executive committee. And in fact, the clubs uh, then made the decision that they would appoint uh, Dr. Koza as the, as the chair. Now, that was a very difficult and controversial decision because it's very rare that you have a club owner who is also the chair of the league. And of course, it can lead to all kinds of um, uh, challenges because mm. um, you know there could there could be all kinds of uh, uh, um, ways in which that team gets favoured. Mm. What what was interesting was that the clubs decided among themselves that they would want to have uh, Dr. Forza to become the the chair, and he's done an incredible job to build the brand of the league. And I think the key to to that is that he was a, a, a man and, and, and still is a man who always, yes, he was a club owner and he did look after his own club very well, but he always saw that the, the, that the league itself must come first because without a successful league, there would not be uh, a, a, a successful club. So, so, so what that meant is that as the money comes in, whether it's from broadcast rights, whether it's from sponsorship rights, the clubs themselves determine how the money gets spent and split. And that, that's really, I think, has enabled them to get a much bigger share of the pie than you will get in other circumstances. So that was important from the government's point of view. Um, yeah, I think that that's, that's, that's a key part. Okay. The key difference that Okay. Um, here again. Uh, here, the clubs. The clubs are, are powerful in the in the structure that we have today. But it's not like it's not that they, they run. They take they take all the decisions. But they they're a very strong block in the decision making pro process. Okay. So, looking at the, um, at, at the MPFL, you know, and and looking at how we have to struggle for support. Um, in the face of the, the overwhelming popularity of the European mm -hmm. leagues. And it's not just Nigeria, it's Sub-Saharan Africa, much, much of Sub-Saharan Africa. How do we win our, our, our fans back? Because we don't have anywhere near this kind of resources that they have in Europe, you know? So what do, what, what do we do, you know, essentially, to be able to let fans in Africa know that, guys, you've got to support um, your clubs, because that's the only route to commercial success. And even if the clubs, or even if the league managers are not doing a good job, then maybe the fight to have is how do we, how do we get these guys out and get competent managers, as opposed to just abandoning your league more or less. Yeah, and I think that you know the structure of governance must not only be a governance for the league; it's got to be the, how the clubs are governed. Mm. Um, and there's two parts of that. There's the, the club licensing, let's call it a, um, a tool okay. for club governance and development. Mm. If you, you know, FIFA has set in place this whole club licensing structure, and if, if, if that club licensing structure is, is, is properly applied and implemented and monitored, um, you are able to then set standards for your coaches, set standards for teams, how they are governed, set standards for teams, how they have development structures in place, how they have women's football in place, etc., etc. Uh, in order to, to play in a league uh, at certain levels, you have to have certain things in place. Now, it, it's quite a, a, a long process to implement a club, club governance structure fully. But you have to start somewhere and agree amongst the teams what are the minimum things that we need to ensure in, in conversation with the Football Association. How do we do that? 
How are the clubs governed there? You know, um, are they run uh, like businesses? Are they run professionally, or are they just a pet project of, of someone? Um, the most successful clubs in in South Africa have gradually professionalized. Um, there always used to be the, the the claim back in my day that some of the clubs were run run out of the the trunk of a car, and uh, that was true to a point. You know, the club owner who probably was a wealthy businessman in his own right um, uh, funded the team, funded the club, and 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 ran the back. You know, ran it out of uh, out of his car. Now that's changed. That doesn't exist in South Africa anymore. But 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 even back in my time, that certainly did exist um, in, in with some of the clubs. So I think you know the need to have consultancy services that the league offers to clubs, marketing support that the league offers to clubs, governance things that they insist upon. Um, all of those things, I think you need to build an environment at a league level supported by the Football Association that provides a gradual professionalizing and governance of clubs so that they can, um, th that sponsors then are confident to put money into. Um, clubs, on, even in South Africa, some clubs battle to get sponsors. That's always been a challenge. Um, but you know, most of the clubs in in in, in the PSL now have got got their own uh, jersey sponsor or club sponsor. Yeah. But they will only have that if 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 they run professionally. If they're not run professionally, they're not going to get a sponsor. Okay. So you know, maybe the league has to be looking at how does it support its clubs through consultancy services, through marketing services. You know, there are massive opportunities that didn't exist back in, 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 in my time there, which I, I alluded to, and that's the whole power now of your, your different forms of low-cost, high-value content that clubs, players, teams can start to produce uh, through social media, through mobile phones, and so on, to start to build a media strategy that will attract and keep fans by telling the conversation, telling the stories, getting those out there. Yeah. And I think that that you know, if I if I were there I, in in Nigeria, I know you got you know, Nigeria's got a massive population. You very the young people are on their mobile phones the whole time. How how are the clubs tapping into those uh, ways of getting their stories out of building? A local fan presence, a building uh, local community um, support, and, and, and mobilizing that through through social media and other forms like that. Okay, um, Dr. Robin, it's been very nice having you on on the program. Um, on the, if you you have a last word, is there something? Um, have you ever worked in Nigeria? Is there is there is there anything that will bring you here to come and do? To, to do any work with, with, say, the league, for instance, or any other league in the country, very quickly, so that we 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 we'll wrap up today, we'll wrap up the program. I have worked in Nigeria, but in a different sector altogether. In between my time at the the PSL and my time in in Safa, I actually ran a, a health products business, and we set one up. And I'm busy working with a partner now in Nigeria in another business um, where we're bringing uh, South African wines into the uh, Nigerian market. But I would love to be able to, um, you know, I have a great uh, partner, Emeka Inyadika, who of course is a legend in Nigerian uh, football from an administration and a media point of view. And I think that, that um, mobilizing the insights of, uh, I'd love to help, you know, if, if um, there's an opportunity, uh, share my wisdom. Um, I, I love Nigeria, I love Nigerian people. And um, I think you're, you're a market that is so incredibly powerful. Um, it, it's a shame that the league is not as successful as I think it could and should be. Okay. I'd, I'd... No, this is just the beginning of our engagement. I, I, I'll be hoping that we can get you back on this program at some other point in the future to, to say more of what I know you still have to say about you know, not just the Nigerian League, the PSL and the leagues across the sub-Saharan sub African region. Thanks for honoring the invitation. It's been a very engaging time and um, um, wish you uh, the, the best for the rest of the day.
And so to do, thank to, you. Uh, yeah. And so to you viewers, uh, thanks for tuning in. It's Happy Independence Day, Nigeria. It's the 64th Independence, and we hope to build on from here. It's not just problems, problems, problems. You know, even you watching me now can do something about you know um, making Nigeria a better country going into the future. Until we meet again next week, this is me, Rufo Ezaga, saying be productive, be good, and stay safe.